in our fall seminar series. Our conversations um, today, our conversation today is on the topic of soil health and healthy ecosystems in rangelands and cropland. So now, maybe more than ever, it's really a privilege to be a part of the forward thinking and creative and adaptable community here at NCS. Um, this community of researchers is really dedicated to accelerating science to address pressing problems facing people on the planet. So before we get started with our program today, I'd like to go over a few housekeeping items. So this conversation is really intended to be informal. Our speakers, Jess Willard, Chelsea Carey, and Steve Wood will provide an opening dialogue to give us a deeper look into the work they're doing around healthy soil and how it promotes healthy rangelands and cropland ecosystems. And then we'll open up the floor to questions from you all. So we're using the webinar feature for this event. So you'll be muted, but um, we'll have a Q&A at the end of the discussion. So we encourage you to submit questions through the chat function at any time throughout this presentation. We also recommend you use the gallery view for this event. So please check the top right-hand corner of your screen to make sure you are in gallery view. And if you have any technical issues throughout this um, day, please, feel free to contact the UCSD and virtual event staff in the chat function. And so before we jump into the main event, I'd like to give you just a quick introduction to NCs. I know many of you are quite familiar with the center, but I also see some new faces in the room. So welcome to you all. Um, the National Center for Ecological Analysis or what we call NCs is a research center affiliate, affiliated with UCSB. And we're based in downtown Santa Barbara, not in the main UCSB campus. At NCs, we bring together experts from diverse disciplines throughout the world to tackle some of the biggest challenges facing our planet, from water pollution to declining diversity, declining biodiversity. Um, and we do this all in a robust scientific way. So we've brought together researchers, environmental nonprofits, businesses, and government stakeholders to look across large data sets and different scientific studies to quantify the amount of plastic in our world's oceans, which helped elevate this issue in public dialogue and catalyze policy action. We've also, for example, worked with partner nonprofits, nonprofits, economists, and international entities to better understand wildlife trade issues. And that helped influence China's ban on the sale and processing of ivory products to better protect African elephants. With dozens of working groups that we have come through the center each year and now that we have convening online, there are many more stories like this that can be told about the global impact we're making at NCs. We pioneered our multidisciplinary working group approach 25 years ago. And since then we've hosted over 20,000 researchers from more than 75 countries around the world. We're also a leader in the environmental data science space um, advancing open science techniques to accelerate discovery in search of solutions to environmental problems. From short data boot camps to multi year postdoc research opportunities, we're training and really providing a launch pad for the next generation of scientists. So I hope you enjoy learning more about our work today and join us for future events as we celebrate this 25th anniversary of NCs. So now I have the pleasure of introducing you to Jeff Willard. Chelsea Carey and Steve Wood. Jeff is the Deputy Director of the Science for Nature and People Partnership, or SNAP, which is a partnership between NCs, the Nature Conservancy, and the Wildlife Conservation Society. And Steve and Chelsea are members of one of our SNAP working groups. Steve Wood is the Senior Scientist for Agriculture and Food Systems at the Nature Conservancy. And Chelsea Carey is the Working Lands Research Director and Principal Soil Ecologist at Blue Point Conservation Science. Together with their working group um, and their team, they've been examining how healthy soil promotes healthy rangelands and cropland ecosystems in California and in the Midwest. So please join me in a warm but quiet Zoom welcome for Jeff, Steve, and Carey. I'm Chelsea, sorry. <laughs> Thanks so much, everybody. Great. Thank you, Courtney, and thanks to everyone for joining us today. So as Courtney was mentioning, um, the Nature Conservancy and the Wildlife Conservation Society are founding partners along with NCs in the Science for Nature and People Partnership. And uh, SNAP, which we call it, applies the NC Synthesis Science Working Group approach in order to research and solve complex problems 
at the intersection of conservation and sustainable development. And over the past seven years, SNAP has funded nearly 50 different working groups, each one investigating unique, urgent challenges facing people and nature in different locations all over the planet. SNAP research is meant to help decision makers change policies and practices in positive ways. And for example, SNAP teams have improved elephant conservation in Africa, fisheries management in remote island communities, and livestock and wildlife population management in Central Asia. So as Courtney mentioned, today we're speaking with two members of SNAP's Soil Carbon Working Group. Uh, and that team over the last few years has set ambitious goals to push soil scientists, soil managers, and farmers to think differently about soil carbon and its relationship to soil conservation. So Steve Wood uh, and Chelsea Carey uh, work for the Nature Conservancy and Point Blue Conservation Science respectively. And thanks to you both for joining us today to share your insights about this project. Um, really special to have you here. Um, yeah, thanks so, for having us. Yeah, thanks. So um, I'm gonna be just lobbing some questions your way and we can kind of keep it nice and informal. Um, but to start off, I guess, what is soil organic carbon and why does it matter? Yeah, so what is soil organic carbon? Well, carbon is a building block of life, right? And there, it comes in a couple of different forms, but organic carbon um, is found in you and me, it's found in plants and animals. And when these organisms die and decay, um, they, they enter the soil, the carbon enters the soil um, as part of the soil organic matter. Um, it, carbon can also enter the soil um, through roots and root exudates. So these are compounds that, that plants can push out through their roots. Um, and all of this carbon, it helps to feed the below ground um, food web um, and, uh, and uh, sort of function and, and supply a lot of these uh, ecosystem benefits that we might care about. Um, so it's organic carbon in the soil is soil organic carbon. And we can talk about all of the awesome things that it does for us and why we might care about it. Yeah, yeah, let's do it. Um, I guess to start off, it might be fun to hear a little bit about what enticed you, you both personally to kind of get interested in that, that in this topic and also to want to convene this SNAP team about it. So um, Steve, can we start with you? Yeah, you know, um, people have been studying soil carbon for such a long time time, you know, it's, it's not like we're starting this um, topic. I think what our, what our niche was, our goal was with the working group is to try to come up with some targets around what would be a quote unquote good or optimal level of soil carbon for managing ecosystems for either conservation or agronomic purposes. Um, there's been, you know, decades of really amazing research on, um, on soil carbon in working lands. But I think when we first started talking about this idea, we felt like we didn't really have too much of a grasp on what level of carbon would be considered like the necessary amount to get to in order to achieve our organizational goals for, you know, agriculture and conservation. And uh, I guess that felt important to think through and try to figure out if we could come up with some answer for because, you know, it takes effort to build soil carbon. You'd have to you know, whatever practice you're doing, whether applying manure or using cover crops or whatever, those things take time, they have costs associated with them. So, you know, it felt important for us to try to like figure out what that sweet spot is in terms of the, the, the right kind of level of soil properties for certain conservation goals. So we could try to think about how do you optimize um, practices and, and interventions in order to achieve those goals. Right on. Yeah. And, and, and Steve, just so we understand uh, your context, what is it you're doing in your kind of normal day to day and how does this project relate to that? Yeah. Uh, so I'm a, a soil ecologist by training, um, you know, did my PhD in kind of soil carbon cycling on farms and uh, at the Nature Conservancy, I'm part of a, like a, a global team where we provide scientific, scientific support to our agriculture and grazing work around the world. Um, and a lot of that now is related to soil health, soil carbon, because agriculture has become such a, uh, a central part of our conservation mission. Um, and I don't just mean row crop agriculture, you know, we think of grazing systems as agricultural systems too, of course. Um, so, you know, I guess there's two buckets to that. One bucket is uh, how working with soil, working on soil health and 
fertility can help improve our conservation objectives, you know, how it can help us achieve water security objectives, um, help work with farmers to increase productivity to maybe take some pressure off of conversion of natural lands. And then the other big bucket that's become popular in the last few years is um, climate mitigation and what we call natural climate solutions with the Nature Conservancy. So I provide scientific support to our, to our climate mitigation work. Yeah, awesome. And Chelsea, would you describe your work as being pretty similar or, or how is it different from what Steve is up to? Yeah, I think it's similar in a lot of ways. So um, Point Blue, we're, we're a nonprofit and we focus generally on climate smart conservation. And so um, that's, you know, building adaptation and resilience into landscapes and mitigating greenhouse gas emissions where possible. And so we work across um, a, sort of a myriad of landscapes, but, um, and, and, and one of our focus um, is on agricultural lands because we see there's a lot of opportunity there to be part of the solution to our biodiversity and climate crises. And so, um, uh, you know, I work with a lot of wildlife um, uh, biologists, a lot of bird biologists, um, and I am, I'm our token soil ecologist right now on staff and I'm helping to, us to sort of, um, yeah, under, do some science and better understand how we can um, manage these landscapes to help achieve multiple benefits, both above and below ground. Great. Cool. All right. So um, you, you both already kind of alluded to what the project was seeking to do. So, I, But I guess um, might you be able to kind of summarize again, what were your main research questions? And then, and then what, um, you know, what did you do to actually use the NC's working group model to then try to solve those or, or answer those questions? Sure. Yeah. Maybe I can talk about the row crop stuff and Chelsea, you can talk about the grazing. Mm -hmm. um, so we had two themes for the group. Uh, one was California grazing lands and one was row crop agriculture in the Midwest. Um, so like I mentioned, a lot of our goals in row crop ag agriculture was thinking about like what's the right level of soil carbon or soil properties to achieve uh, kind of a mix of agricultural and environmental goals. In terms of what we did, um, it was, we, we did a, a couple of uh, data syntheses where we looked at studies that um, re reported data on soil carbon and on agronomic performance. And we tried to figure out if there was a, a sweet spot level of soil carbon and organic matter for achieving um, or optimizing crop yields. And then from there, we, we did a similar study um, that was less focused on crop yields, like the amount of crop yield and more focused on yield stability. Um, so how much yield changes under adverse weather conditions. And then the third project that we did in the row crop space was we developed a, a platform called Ag Evidence, which is um, a web platform you can go to, it's agevidence.org. And um, the postdoc who worked with us on this project, Leslie Atwood, her main effort was to synthesize and pull all of the data on a suite of conservation agriculture practices in the in the Midwest, things like cover crops, reduced tillage, targeted nutrient management, and basically find all the data that's out there and all the kind of environmental and agronomic outcomes associated with those practices and to show those data in like a, a, a web dashboard, a kind of visualization tool where anybody can access um, this cutting edge science on the impact of these practices in, in the US Corn Belt. So it's more of a kind of data visualization interface tool rather than a peer reviewed publication, which the other two were. Yeah, and, for, and so for some of our grazing lens work, um, you know, we ended up one of the main sort of um, products or projects we focused on was summarizing um, the evidence, sort of the published evidence um, for uh, rangeland management practices within California specifically to influence soil parameters and then some forage production parameters as well. So forage production and quality. Um, so the motivation here is that um, uh, within California, we're, it's super exciting because we have things like the, the California Department of Food and Agricultural Healthy Soils Program um, which essentially incentivizes stewardship practices to help build soil carbon across our agricultural landscapes to be part of the climate solution. Um, you know, there's a, I think there's a question, there's a lot to, um, yeah, there's sort of a question about 
um, to what degree can some of these practices like managed grazing, um, silvopasture, so sort of planting trees, restoring your riparian areas, um, uh, can they sort of do what we're asking them to do below ground and above ground? And then, um, and to what degree, right? Sort of like at what magnitude can we expect changes um, uh, to occur? And so we, um, we focus specifically on California and summarize sort of, yeah, the evidence for riparian restoration, grazing, um, silvopasture, so planting trees, and then compost additions and how, and how they affect all of these sort of below ground parameters. Cool. And, and so there's a, there's so much there. And, you know, Steve, as you mentioned, there's this, there's been so much research into, into this topic for, for many, many years, many generations. So I wonder, um, you know, when you're actually in, in, in an MC's conference space with your, you know, 10 to 20 individuals who are part of your working group, um, how are you looking at the research uh, and, and trying to, trying to innovate in a way that's, that's really kind of producing, producing new knowledge? Um, and also in a way that is tailored to the, the needs of the user. How do you, how do you try, to, try to do both of those things at once? Are there, are there any specific tactics you learned that you, you found really helpful? Do you want to take a stab? Yeah, well, I mean, I think, you know, anytime you're, you're, you know, I think that there's an aspect inherent in sort of these syntheses that is producing new knowledge and that is um, sort of being cutting edge to some degree, right? Because we're, um, you're allowing for insights to emerge that might not have previously existed. So in some cases, maybe it's just obvious. You're like, well, it's overwhelming evidence in the literature that oaks influence soil carbon. Okay, well, we're seeing that in our evidence synthesis. That's great. Okay, it's then, now you've produced a nice product that you can point to and, and you know, use in conversations with your, you know, your end community. But I think there's also a lot of cases where there's a need for these synthesis to um, syntheses to reveal sort of these underlying patterns um, that might not otherwise be apparent if you didn't do them. And so I think that that's where a lot of the strength lies and where a lot of sort of whether or not you call it cutting edge, I do think it provides this really important information. And it's just sort of um, being involved with these end communities in some way, like as TNC is or as Point Blue is that we sort of are hoping that we're asking and addressing questions that are highly relevant um, to, you know, um, on the ground action. The thing that for me that I was thinking about when you asked that question, Jeff, is <laughs> maybe it sounds a little silly, but um, it's just the opportunity to like sit down and think and think with a group of people who are both really smart, really experienced and have like a, a diverse set of backgrounds and experiences. I feel like for, I, I don't know about Chelsea, but for me, like at, at the Nature Conservancy, just by the, the nature of the work, I feel like I've got like, you know, 10% of my time on one project and 15% on another. And I, I'm kind of constantly in this space of having to like produce over like a fairly short period of time products for kind of rapid like conservation work. and. You know, I have kind of like ideas that are half baked that are kind of floating in the back of my head that I very rarely get the opportunity to really like dig into um, and think through how to operationalize them to inform and influence what we do. And just having the space to get together as a group, whether in person or on Zoom, you know, like a, a few times a year for a few days. I mean, that just has huge value in terms of really figuring out like what's actually needed in the science space for our organization. Um, and again, like having folks from university, business, nonprofits, having those folks all be able to shape those ideas, it just gives a new perspective. Very cool. Yeah, thanks for those reflections. So you've, you've already alluded to kind of some of the, um, the discoveries that you are working towards. I wonder, would you be able to summarize, um, A, you know, the, the, the research conclusions uh, of the project, and then B, the products uh, that the project um, uh, created that can that can then be used to work with decision makers. Yeah, so I, I guess I can go first. So, um, so our synthesis was able to um, identify sort of where there was strong evidence for the ability for practices to influence soil parameters, where there was evidence that was lacking. Um, and then where context might matter. Um, I think that those are sort of the three buckets of information that we were really able to glean from this. Um, 
you know, so as, a, as an example, and like I said before, right, like we found that oak, the presence of oaks on the landscape, they create these islands of fertility um, below them where you have elevated soil carbon levels, elevated um, nutrient levels, um, things like that. So so that emerged as something that was like a really strong pattern in our in our um, evidence synthesis. Um, on the flip side, right, like we we couldn't um, look at the effects of grazing on the landscape beyond presence or absence. So that because information was so limited, um, and that's a that's a real um, that's a really important thing to be able to do um, because often the conversation is not. Um, yes or no, there, it's going to be grazed or ungrazed. Often the conversation is how do you graze, right? Um, for managing, you know, up to 30% of California's land area, um, which is grazable lands, if not more. And so, um, so you know, we showed there that there was um, sort of a gap in knowledge that, that could, um, it'd be useful to fill with future research. Um, and then, and then something, you know, and then sort of for context, right, um, we're able to show that like soil texture can actually moderate the effects of some of these practices, um, which is not surprising, but hasn't been shown necessarily within this context before. So um, the benefits or this sort of increase in soil carbon with oaks, for instance, um, was elevated in and soils that had more clay content. So this can help to inform sort of management recommendations, I think, right? So what you can expect um, as a function of your of, of sort of your context or your situation. Um, and we, uh, it's a published manuscript. So we, you know, um, sort of, uh, it's not sort of this web-based tool, which is super cool, like um, like Leslie and Steve have, have worked up, but um, is instead it's sort of a published manuscript. We published it in California Agriculture, which is a regional journal that a lot of producers um, pick up. And, um, and so we were hoping that that would reach our tar target audience effectively. Um, for for the, the row crop focused work, I guess the high level takeaway for, for me would be filling soil carbon is generally something that's good for crop yields. Um, around 2% soil carbon seems to be like a kind of global sweet spot, but that global number might not be all of that useful because there's so much variation and that, you know, different soil types in different places have different abilities to build soil carbon. Um, they have different needs for what soil carbon can provide in terms of water or nutrients. Um, in dry conditions, especially like, you know, extreme drought years, the effect of soil carbon on crop yields seems to be strongest rather than in kind of quote unquote normal years. Um, areas of at least the US, the Corn Belt that uh, have higher soil carbon tend to have lower crop insurance uh, payouts, indemnities basically, um, which is cool and interesting. <laughs> so it's not just about yield, total yield, it's about kind of risk reduction too. Um, and then there are some clear environmental benefits from some of the practices that build soil carbon. Um, so like something like cover crops that builds soil carbon or can build soil carbon, um, it's pretty much always good for reducing nutrient losses into water systems. Um, but, you know, some of the impacts, the direct impacts of those practices on agronomic outcomes or on other soil properties can be variable. So um, I said before, cover crops can build soil carbon because in some places they do, in some places they don't. Um, and similar thing for yields, like in some cases uh, you might see a little bit of a yield hit, especially early on from using some of these practices. Um, that may come back up after a little bit of time. In some cases it's more of a, a clear win. Um, so there's kind of both direct and indirect uh, impacts of these practices. So it's not just about soil carbon. Some of the, the, the effects of the practices you might used to build soil carbon can have other impacts on the system as well. Right on. And um, you're both with the Nature Conservancy and Point Blue Conservation Science respectively, um, which, you know, you know, through those organizations, you're working directly with a lot of uh, soil scientists and soil managers and, and other decision makers that, um, that can change practice. Are you noticing yet uh, that that the work from this project is already informing decisions on the ground, um, or or what? Uh, at what stage are you in, in trying to make that happen? Yeah. So um, when we when the when our publication first came out, we um, we made the point to share it with um, 
uh, certain constituents that we thought um, it might be most useful to, right? So we shared it with folks at the um, California Department of Food and Agriculture, um, the NRCS, um, RCD, some resource conservation districts, and all of these organizations in some capacity um, are either in you know, funding or assisting or actually implementing a lot of these practices on the landscapes and talking with farmers and ranchers as they make decisions about whether and how to do so. Um, and, you know, just one, ex so, um, so we definitely got the word out fast and the, um, and then I can give an, a specific example of how it's already informed um, some, some conversations. So the Mid Peninsula Regional Open Space District is a, um, a local agency in the Bay Area. Um, and they just uh, generated a grazing brief um, to give to their board of directors. So some of the scientists generated a grazing brief to um, essentially sort of um, document or summarizing the, um, the, the, um, the effects or the, um, the published evidence for grazing to help achieve conservation outcomes, um, which could include things like in, from their perspective, um, uh, like climate change mitigation. And, uh, and so they, you know, they leaned heavily on our evidence synthesis within that report, um, you know, to justify things like, you, you know, we didn't see that the presence of grazing reduced soil carbon um, compared to ungrazed land. So it, in that way, it can be compatible, I would say, with maintaining soil carbon stocks of these rangelands. Um, which is an important part of climate change mitigation in and of itself. Um, and then they were able to point to our evidence synthesis for sort of things like compost additions um, and, and the civil pasture as well. And so that's just one example of an agency already taking what we've published and using it to sort of inform the board of directors as they make decisions about how these lands that they've acquired are stewarded. I feel like, just, Chelsea, sometimes I feel like I'm jealous of your job because you get to do this amazing place-based science. It's really tangible. And for me, cool. like my on the ground is, is like not really actually on the ground. It's more like in the boardroom or something like that because a lot of TNC, like the work that we do is so partnership-based and very high level. So like for me, what impact, I guess it looks like from our science is more like how do we bring that evidence into coalitions that we're part of to um, kind of advocate for specific types of practices or specific approaches. Um, you know, so for instance, I was mentioning crop insurance. TNC is a member of the Agree Coalition, which is a, a multi-party coalition to lobby for crop insurance reform. So, um, you know, we're members of that. We kind of bring our perspectives and our evidence to the table there, but alongside like, other scientists, other nonprofits, um, members of companies, et cetera. So I would say a lot of where like our evidence shows up is in terms of um, making the case to companies, to other nonprofits, just to our partners um, kind of throughout really the ag supply chain and, and policy sphere about what we think are um, practices and approaches that have solid evidence for um, providing benefits to people in nature. Steve, it takes all kinds and all levels of engagement. <laughs> Fair enough. Um, yeah, that's all super great. And I'll just, I'll just mention for everybody, um, the, your, your project's uh, outcomes and ongoing impacts are updated on, on uh, your project's SNAP working group webpage, uh, which you can find it, um, on the SNAP website. Um, so uh, I guess you know you kind of you guys have, have, have wrapped up this project fairly recently um, and, and, and are maybe now kind of turning to you know the next big projects that might be on your plate. I wonder if you were theoretically to uh, to propose another SNAP working group um, that would be maybe a follow on to this or, or maybe totally different. I wonder um, now that you kind of are veterans of the process, I wonder what you what project you would be interested in proposing. Chelsea, do you want to go first? You want me to go? I don't know. If I, I would. I would say more of the same. Like I want more. Like I want more soil carbon. You know, working groups. I'd take another round. I feel like <laughs> I feel like we did a lot, and there's you know, and there's still a lot more that we could do. I think um, I thought of a lot about kind of like what made our group successful, and um, or if it was successful, and what we could have changed, and. I don't know that I've changed anything, but one thing that I've, I, I noticed is like, we came into the working group with like 
mm, kind of a, a concept or an ambition rather than like a, a tool that we wanted to focus our work on. And I think that was good because it, it allowed us to like have a wide view and figure out what we really wanted to narrow in on. And I think now I would probably start a group that was um, starting from something that was a little bit narrower, I guess, where we could really from day one, just like start on building that thing. Um, I guess where my mind has been recently is in scaling ag evidence. Um, the platform that I, that I mentioned, you know, when we, um, when we started this, at the Nature Conservancy, pretty much all of our uh, coordinated agriculture work was happening in the US Corn Belt. And that was probably five years ago or so. And since then it's changed rapidly. I mean, our entire Latin America lands-based conservation strategy turns on agriculture. Similarly in Africa, a huge amount of what we're doing is based on kind of um, avoiding damages from agriculture, but more than that, seeing ag agriculture as a potential like solution and benefit to ecosystems. And we're, we're starting to put together like a, a global framing for all of the 70 plus countries that we work in around how um, foodscapes and food systems and agricultural systems can be in a, like a crucial part of, of how, we, how we think about, you know, our conservation work. So for me, like I've gotten so much enthusiasm from my colleagues outside of the Corn Belt who want to see what this tool can do in other places. Um, in some cases, that those are like people who are doing like boots on the ground conservation work in say East Africa. But in some cases, it's folks who are part of uh, companies that have global supply chains. And yes, the US Corn Belt might be an important part of those supply chains, but it's a much bigger picture than that. And so, um, yeah, I guess what I would love to do is kind of take that ag evidence model of basically getting all the cutting edge science and really putting it forward in a like a user friendly, compelling way that where anyone can get insights from it. And just, and this is really ambitious, but like, you know, kind of making it a global effort. So that would probably be beyond like a single other staff group, but uh, that's kind of where my mind goes. I, yeah, I like that a lot. I mean, there's something to say for these decision support tools, you know, like sort of building in this, these, these, the, the evidence into something that can be used interactively by whether it's producers or agencies or, you know, technical assistance providers. I feel like there's something really powerful. And then we've seen it for a lot of other areas of conservation, right? Like the usefulness of sort of informing like conservation action. And so I would, I would, I would support that. I use it all the time. I feel like cool. I've decided that it's useful because I use it in my day-to-day -day job. No, it's super cool. <laughs> yeah, that's great. Um, that's really inspiring. Um, and, and it's great that uh, you're thinking big, Steve. I love it. Um, and I guess, I guess on that note, thinking big and kind of expansively, I wonder, you know, we're in, uh, politically, we're in a very interesting moment right now. And assuming Joe Biden, you know, uh, is inaugurated in, in, a, in a couple of months, I wonder if you guys have kind of strong opinions about what you think the future of soil policy and management in the U.S. should be um, and, and, you know, realistic ways in which, uh, in which a Biden administration might be able to, um, to inform that. Steve, do you have thoughts? Um, you probably have more thoughts than I do, but I'll just say a couple of quick things. The fir first one is that there's been so much actually like momentum at the state level over the past few years. Um, Chelsea can tell you all about like the California stuff that's happening. I just feel like there's a lot of opportunity to consolidate and um, expand that work to something that's kind of federally focused. You know, there've been state policy frameworks in Massachusetts and, you know, like Maryland, California, like a lot of states that are thinking about soil health in a legislative context. So yeah, I think there's um, opportunity there. I guess for me, where my mind maybe goes is, um, the potential to create programs or at least um, policy settings in which private markets for environmental benefits for from um, agriculture can thrive. Um, at least from where we sit at the T at TNC in our perspective, we feel like getting farmers paid for non-food uh, you know services that they provide is, an, is a crucial component to incentivizing practices. Um, certainly there's a, like a like a kind of federal policy approach to that that's maybe more of like a, 
uh, I don't know, kind of akin to what's happening in California, but um, a lot of what we're, of what we're thinking about is ecosystem services markets. And so, yeah, just policy approaches that, that create a, a kind of context for those private markets to, to, to work well for farmers, I think would be exciting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't know if I have like any specific sort of actionable thoughts sort of like at the national scale. I mean, I think that the sort of the, if I think about the future of soil policy, like, I mean, it's going to require, right, that we elevate soil, continue to elevate soil as a national, uh, like as a national or natural resource. Um, and, you know, we should recognize it and prioritize it as sort of foundational to our food system. Um, and so so whatever changes that requires from a policy perspective and how we approach agriculture, I think is gonna be really critical and to include sort of a diverse, sort of all the diverse constituents who, part, who are influenced by and influence sort of that broader system is gonna be really, really important. Um, I think like another um, aspect of this is that um, the, that a lot of sort of, um, the, the action should be supported by evidence, right? And that's sort of a lot of the motivation that Steve and, you know, Steve and I and others in this working group were, um, uh, um, were sort of conducting these projects under. And, and, and so I think that there's like continued support for cross-disciplinary research to fund sort of, um, yeah, like applied research, both sort of from a traditional standpoint, but also from sort of non-traditional ways. So like one example is in within California, um, the Healthy Soils Program, they not only incentivize practices, but they, um, they provide funding for demonstration projects. And these demonstration projects are one, one uses outreach tools, but also two, um, uh, they can be used to conduct some pretty relatively rigorous research on greenhouse gas fluxes, emissions, and, and gains in soil carbon with these management practices. So I think there's a lot of opportunity to find creative ways to support research that so that we can sort of continue to inform um, how to put these practices and, and achieve principles on the ground in a scalable way. Yeah. And um... I guess to that note of kind of elevating the issue, you know, nationally and then and, and broadly, I wonder, do you guys feel like there's anything in particular that individuals can do to um, to try to, you know, have make positive impacts on, on soil health in the long term, um, either through their purchasing habits or or you know or gardening or or, or other other behaviors that they may be doing. Uh, yeah. I mean, yeah. Go ahead, Steve. I think individual decisions, individual purchasing decisions, or just public opinion is hugely influential because it seems like, you know, again, we work with a lot of, a lot of companies um, and I do feel like a lot of companies are like heavily aware of kind of public perceptions of uh, what they do and how their supply chains operate. Um, you know, in different parts of the world that looks different, you know, maybe in Europe, maybe there's more individual pressure on a regulatory framework that then influences how companies work. In the U.S., it seems to be a little bit more like individuals shape um, as consumers shape companies more directly, and then that feeds up into potential policy changes. But um, yeah, I just generally have the sense that uh, the kind of large-scale agribusiness entities that can have a huge influence in this space are very aware of uh, public perception of sustainable agriculture. And you see that just through like the proliferation of um, commitments around like uh, net neutral emissions from, from companies, not just food ag companies, actually companies like Amazon, Microsoft, et cetera. Um, yeah, so I, you know, regenerative agriculture is now like a widely used term and a way that's not controversial, it seems, amongst uh, companies that are, are are fairly centrist agribusiness companies, whereas 10 years ago, regenerative agriculture would have um, not been something you would have heard at all in, in kind of uh, general run of the mill ag uh, circles. So yeah, I think I think consumers have a lot of a lot of power. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was gonna say, yeah, like sort of as a consumer, like know your food and know your farmer kind of thing, you know, to the extent that you can. Um, I think just recognizing that soil health matters 
Um, so whether you're a consumer or if you're a producer, like a farmer or a rancher, I mean, just recognizing that soil matters. And, and if you are sort of managing a landscape, I would say um, paying attention to your land can go a long way, right? Just recognizing that your soil is important and sort of what we say at Point Blue is like reading the land, right? Um, and, and you know, and not having to even get too fancy with, with management, but, you know, adaptively managing these landscapes in a way that, um, that you're sort of trying out things, um, seeing what happens and changing management accordingly to help achieve your soil health goals, um, even if they may be sort of broad or general. Um, and if you track, you can even track them in a very general way. Like you don't have to get super fancy with it right away. I think that just that intentional management and stewardship um, with an eye towards or, or thought towards your soil health. Um, like I said, I think that can is a good first, first step and can go a long way. Very cool. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. And, and on the note of um, regenerative agriculture, Steve, that you mentioned, uh, I'll just point out to folks if if, uh, if folks haven't yet seen um, a documentary that's now available on Netflix called Kiss the Ground, that might be a nice way to explore these issues a little more in their, in their relationship to climate change and, and other things. Did you guys see that in film and do you recommend it? Do you feel like they, they did the science well? I have seen it. Yeah. And um, I think, you know, from my perspective, the, the, the strength of a, like this this kind of film has a lot of power in its storytelling abilities, right? Like they can engage a broad audience. It's a great outreach tool. I think they got a lot of things right. Um, and so I would recommend it. I think that, you know, they there are certainly things, um, details within it that I think are um, maybe not entirely accurate or, um, or exaggerated, but but maybe the point of a film like this isn't to get everything right. Like maybe that's okay, right? Like the, the general idea is that soils really matter. We haven't always done it right. Let's get it right now. Um, and if that's the message that everybody walks away with from that film, I, I think that's a win. Ditto, yeah, felt the same. Cool, all right. Well, check, check out the movie then if you haven't already seen it. Um, I think we can, we can switch over now to Q and A from the, from the crowd if there is any. And I guess I'll just check the chat box for that. Um, so feel free to send them. Uh, oh yeah, Josh Schimmel says, uh, we never get it all right even in our papers. Why would we expect it in a film? Josh gets it right in his papers, the rest of us just don't. <laughs> I think it's a really good point, yeah. Okay, so we have a question. What, uh, uh, how is this research being communicated to folks that work in agriculture at a smaller scale, if at all? I think Chelsea's probably best to answer that because like I said, like we at TNC have kind of made the decision that we don't, we don't really work too much with individual farmers. We don't see that as our niche. Um, you know, we don't think necessarily that a big environmental NGO is the right, uh, avenue for working directly with farmers and trying to communicate with farmers about how to farm. So, you know, we try to support broader supply chain and policy efforts and feel like that there are other people like Chelsea and Point Blue who are really good at doing that, you know, on the ground type of work. Yeah, so I mean, we, you know, just as one example, um, we have a program of um, where we have staff members who um, live and work throughout the state and NRCS offices. So it's a cost share program. And we have um, at any given time, like between 10 and 12 ish staff members who have their point blue hat and their NRCS hat. Um, and we're able to engage with thousands of producers, farmers and ranchers to help uh, leverage farm bill dollars and implement conservation practices. Um, and we're also able to do um, some ecological monitoring through our um, through this partnership as well. And so um, so we are sort of like this kind of work sort of empowers our staff members to have the no, sort of this, this synthesized knowledge and ability to sort of um, understand uh, sort of what the state of state of the science is and communicate that with all of these producers that they're interacting with on a daily basis. So I think it's sort of like, and this go, you know, and a lot of these are like um, uh, small, like sort of uh, small farm ranch owners um, and it's very local scale. And so I think that that's one sort of direct way that this kind of research can inform um, action at these smaller scales. Great, cool. Well, we have a few other questions here. We can, maybe we can get through each of them if we have time. Um, from Lydia Blyfus, she says, hi, Steve. 
Wondering if you could speak a bit more about risk reduction via higher carbon in soil and the relationship with crop insurance. Gosh, how can I be succinct and concise when talking about crop insurance? Um, so basically the, the kind of big picture issue here is that crop insurance rates for farmers aren't really based on the practices that you do and the steps you might take to reduce your risk at the farm level. A lot of pretty much insurance rates are determined at the county level. And then there's kind of some discounting factors that are applied to get some farm specific rates, but it's generally kind of like county level uh, accounting framework. So um, the work that I was talking about, but there's been other you know, research happening on this too, has started to show that um, soil carbon and other practices too, like things like crop diversification can be important features in uh, in reducing risk and, and, and buffering yield losses in, in extreme weather uh, years. So the, the question now is like, well, how can you start to take that knowledge and incorporate it into these specific accounting frameworks that are used for crop insurance and um, reform that system? Um, because federal crop insurance program is heavily uh, centralized and regulated. There is a private insurance component to it, but it, um, largely is just determined by uh, the federal, uh, the federal, federal kind of uh, regulated uh, program, where it's not like, you know, other insurance markets, like the coastal um, insurance market has a, has a large private reinsurer component to it. Um, so yeah, so um, there's some new, there's some more science that needs to happen, I would say, though. Um, a lot of the science that's been done has been a fairly broad scale. Part of that is because there's really not um, good uh, farm level data that's been released that would allow you to do these risk, risk assessments for individual operations. Um, the federal crop insurance program releases some data publicly, but it's aggregated to the county scale. They have um, finer scale data, but they're not uh, made available to the public. So a bunch of people are talking about um, how can you, you know, use kind of innovative, maybe private sector based data sets to, to look at this um, kind of risk reduction um, benefit um, and quantify that at the field scale. But, but so far, um, not a ton has been done at that scale. And I think that's kind of going to be the next thing to happen. And then, then we'll see how that would actually inform uh, reforms to the crop insurance program if it, if it would at all. Nice. Um, we have a uh, request for a clarification from Emily Hickenbottom. She says, Chelsea, you mentioned there's an organization already in the process of employing uh, some of the work of this working group that, um, that has done developed around soil carbon practices. What was the name of that organization? Uh, yeah, so it was the Mid Peninsula Regional Open Space District. Cool. Um, she says, thank you. Um, from Jacob, hello, thank you both. How are you thinking about recommending soil management practices under a changing climate? What are you more or less certain about in a hotter future climate? Wow. Hi, Jacob. <laughs> um, I think it's a, it's a good question. I mean, and you, so Jacob used to work at Point Blue. Um, and so uh, he knows that, you know, a lot of the ways that we think Think about implementation of practices. Um, we think about from sort of a what we call like a, a climate smart lens. And so, um, just as one example, so I think I think from my perspective, a lot of it comes in like with how you implement a practice, right? So if we're going to restore a riparian area because we know it is going to build carbon for us, we can select um, plant species, for instance, that we that have traits that will allow it to withstand the conditions that we expect to be at that site. Um, same with, you know, if we're doing silvopasture on rangelands, um, upland sites on rangelands, like we, you know, can start to, we're doing some work right now to see whether or not genetics of oaks um, influence their ability to withstand hotter, drier conditions. And so if we're going to do plantings, maybe we sort of pull from um, certain genetic pools from the regional species um, pool in order to uh, make sure that these practices that we think are going to improve soil health um, are going to be actually successful. I don't know, Steve, if you have other thoughts. That's such a good question. I guess the only thing that came to mind as like a somewhat coherent answer is to like just allow for and, and incentivize like innovation in soil health management other under 
like climate change because I think it's going to be so hard for us to predict what that's actually going to be what it's going to look like. I mean, we might have some ideas like I don't know if y'all remember uh, in 2019 there was this uh, Twitter hashtag it was like no plant 2019 or something like that because it was such a, a wet spring it was hard for farmers to get into their their fields and some farmers who were doing cover crops they were even further delayed because they had even kind of more moisture in the in the fields into the spring and so um, I think that forced a lot of people to realize that systems that we might have been advocating for a while, like cover crops, are going to have to look really different in the future. And it's going to require innovation, like maybe, for instance, technological innovation that allows you to seed your cover crop earlier in the fall, like while your cash crop is still in the field or something. So it's not going as late into the spring. Um, that's just kind of one, one thought. But I think that kind of thinking about how do we innovate in this space under um, situations that we can't perfectly predict right now is going to be an important feature. Great. Well, we, it looks like we have one other question and maybe that can kind of glide us home here. Um, what are some of the challenges and conversely, what are some of the unexpected bright spots in being part of a SNAP working group? Um, there's so, I mean, the, I feel like we've talked about a lot of the benefits, you know, like getting to work with um, people from, you know, across your field who you're not necessarily always working with, having the, um, I'm like drawn to use the word pressure, but it's not the right word because that kind of implies negative, but like. Accountability. The push, yeah, the, the push to like produce like really applied useful things okay. and not just default to what we're comfortable with, which is like publishing a paper, you know, um, which isn't to say that publishing a paper isn't good, right? Like Chelsea's talking about this work that was in a paper, but like we thought a lot about what, as she said, like what journal to publish it in and who we wanted to reach and what kind of forum they might be, you know, reading in. So that that for me is like totally changed how I think about even my, my science outside of the SNAP group is to kind of constantly push myself to think about who's the audience, how they're going to use the tool um, or use the product. Um, so yeah. Mm -hmm. challenges? I don't know. I think for our group, what, what were the challenges? I guess one of the challenges, it's like everyone's super busy outside of these working groups. And, um, you know, when you're together, you're really present with each other. But sometimes it can be hard to like, get people motivated to keep the momentum going, like in the time in between the working groups. Mm -hmm. um, and then sometimes even just scheduling them, you know, like, a lot of us were not West Coast based. I think very few were. And so it required like people traveling from East Coast to Santa Barbara. You know, as you all know, Santa Barbara isn't always like the most direct place to fly in and out of. And so it just re required like people giving a lot of their time too, to just make it in person. Um, and so just kind of coordinating all that and staying on top of all that was was a challenge. It wasn't, wasn't bad by any means, but it just, you know, required some work and effort and just trying to get, you know, keep the enthusiasm going. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think, I think um, for me, it was just a lot of bright spots. I think the challenges like that Steve is talking about, you know, I didn't directly experience necessarily because I wasn't helping to coordinate all of the meetings. Um, but, you know, it was, I think, so, um, it was so cool to be able to get in that, you know, get in a room with all these people who are thinking about, the challenges and opportunities for managing soil carbon from different angles, right? And from different backgrounds and expertise and experiences. And so um, I think it definitely helped to, yes, yeah, strengthen sort of my work more generally and, and help build like a community um, uh, with folks who I, I might not have, um, you know, known or interacted with closely um, necessarily um, otherwise. And so, I, I, yeah, I think it was just a super great opportunity to sort of build out these ideas and, and products. Great. Well, hopefully one of these days, once the world is um, maybe a little bit more back to normal, we can get you both back at uh, NCs in Santa Barbara and see you again. Yeah, that'd be great. great. Love it. Cool. Well, that's all the questions looks like we have in the chat box. Um, so I guess I just want to extend thanks to you both, Steve and Chelsea, as well as everyone who joined us today. Um, we do have two more of these coming over the next uh, couple weeks in celebration of NC's 25th anniversary. So um, check your email inboxes and alerts for, for stuff uh, related for the next programs. And I guess um, any final thoughts, Steve or Chelsea, that you'd like to share with the crowd? 
I just want to say thanks for, for this, but also just for like the SNAP working group uh, in general. I think like Chelsea mentioned, like I think all of us grew a ton individually through our working group as well as, you know, like the impact that it's had directly on some of our organizational work. So I know I, for one, just feel really appreciative for that. Yeah, that's just what I would say as well as thank you so much. Um, and, you know, uh, and thanks for inviting us to participate in this, uh, in this event too. Yeah, yeah, super fun. Our pleasure. It's been, it's been really great. Uh, um, so thanks again, guys. And uh, we'll, we'll talk to you soon. Bye. All right. Take care. Bye.